All right, here we go. We're, this is an exciting one. Um, we just finished law of sines in the previous set, and now we're going to go on to law of cosines. And uh, I know that always leads us to a couple of uh, little questions that come. First off, if there's a law of sines and a law of cosines, does that make a law of tangents? <laughs> Not that I've ever heard of. Uh, turns out we just need the two, and so math, once we have a good way of solving a problem, is pretty efficient. We don't usually invent a brand new one, although I guess maybe that's not true because we have a million of them for ways to do quadratics. But you know, a lot of sines and cosines is great. Also, um, uh, yeah, I, I, there's another question that I was thinking that people often ask and now it's just escaped me, but it doesn't really matter. We're going to go on and take a look at law of cosines. It's specifically a method that is going to allow us to solve side, 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 and side, angle, side. I think that was the question that was coming before. Side, 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 and side, angle, side problems were ones that would, were not solvable using the law of sine, so we had to come up with law of cosines, or mathematicians did. So we're gonna do that. I do wanna show you where it comes from. It is definitely a little bit of a tough, um, way of uh, the, the development is a little bit aggressive so we're going to see if we can do a good job on developing that so what we're going to start with very much like what we did in the previous video i'm going to start with a simple triangle right here and uh, in fact i'm going to go ahead and choose to draw this one on an axis because i just like it a little bit better and uh, i'm going to go ahead and pick this point right here let's come on down this point right here come on down and I'm going to name this point right here X and Y and one thing I would like to note to you guys is that that is an X Y and that's literally um, a variable I've seen people like to present this as all these multiple cases and, and really I really I don't think that's a good argument if you call it X and Y X and Y are variables which means they could be positive they could be negative and therefore they're in every quadrant that's out there now what we're going to do is we're going to call this little side A, which means this is vertex A down here, this side C, this is rotated off of my previous argument, uh, but no big deal, and this is going to be B, so we've got vertex C over here, we've got vertex A over here, and we've got vertex B up here, not that it matters too much, but you know, unfortunately, in, in certain circumstances, it just would be so much nicer if we actually had the ability to use regular Sokotoa trig. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop in a little altitude here. So right down here, I'm gonna drop this thing in, and just like in the previous argument, we're gonna call this thing H. And what's really super nice that I can do is I could then say that the sine of angle C would be h over a, making a times the sine of angle c would be that variable h. Now, that's what we did, and before we went ahead and looked at the sine of a instead, but this time we're going to do a very, very different story. Now, uh, this coordinate, by the way, right here, moved over from the origin, and any triangle can be put on this axis, and that's kind of important. So this coordinate right here is gonna be B0, that's X0. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and remind you of, of a little story that, that, that you saw back in the day. It's called the distance formula. So I'm gonna put that right up here. And you wanna remember that if you ever have two points, x2, uh, x2, y2, and uh, x1, y1, that you can actually make a little formula which is the difference of the x1 squared and the difference of the y's squared, and then square rooted. This comes straight out of the Pythagorean theorem. We've done that before, but we're just gonna go ahead and leave that alone for the moment. Now, I'm also gonna look at the cosine of, um, angle C and uh, the cosine of C is a little bit interesting because the cosine is the adjacent but when you look at this adjacent you're like but I don't know that that, that doesn't go the whole way across I, I mean it's adjacent over hypotenuse so I still know that it's a but oh but it's okay it's right here this value if you notice if this is X and this is Y then it turns out this is X and this height right here is y. That's very, very important. It lines up with this piece of data right there. So 
I could just call this X. So in fact, not only that, I could replace this H that I had right here with Y. So I could say A times the sine of C is Y, and over here that X is A times the cosine of C. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go at this at a, a kind of an interesting little way, is I'm gonna use that distance formula to talk about what this length of C is. So keep in mind that C, the length C according to the distance formula is the square root of, let's see, it would be the difference of the x's, which would be like x minus b, quantity squared, because this x value is x, that one's b, plus the difference of the y values squared. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take and substitute these particular little gems that we just found in here. So c is therefore the square root of the x minus b, which would be a times the cosine of c minus b quantity squared, plus y, which is a times the sine of c quantity squared. Now this does take a little bit of uh, distribution and kind of working this out. And remember, if you ever take something like this, where you have uh, a quantity like, let's say, I'll use some different letters here, but uh, if we had an x and a y squared, remember you get an x squared and you get two x y's and y squared. We call that the binomial distribution, but remember you're foiling. So since I'm distributing this out right here, oh, and by the way, if this was a minus, this would, two would be a minus. So I'm gonna go ahead and distribute that out. So as it turns out, c is the square root of a squared times the cosine squared of c minus 2b, oh, actually 2ba, I wish I'd said ab, but it's okay, cosine of c, plus b squared. And then over here, this is just a monomial being squared, so that's a squared sine squared c. Now, something really, really kind of nice just happened if we just move things around. You'll notice right here, this term and this term both have an a squared in common. So if we were to do that, I could say a squared times the cosine squared of c, and this a squared goes with this sine squared of c, minus two, I'm gonna go ahead and flip that around, I just like it better, cosine of c is what I've got. Now, I think many of you at this moment in time realize what's actually happening, let me move this paper up a little bit, is that right there, this is our handy dandy little Pythagorean identity. Anytime you have a sine squared plus a cosine squared of the same angle, you always get one. And so we end up with this simplified identity, which I know doesn't look all that nice. Oh, and I, I dropped my b squared right there, didn't I? Let me put plus b squared. Kind of knew I was missing something. A, B, cosine C. Now I'm gonna square both sides because this is actually just how we like to do it. So I have C squared is A squared plus B squared. Hey, wait a minute, you've seen that before. That looks like the Pythagorean theorem. But remember the Pythagorean theorem is only usable on right triangles. And we never stipulated that this was a right triangle. So what you now have is a more robust equation called the law of cosines that actually allows you to solve not only right triangles, but non-right triangles. Because if angle C was 90, this would be zero and we would have the Pythagorean theorem back. But this will work for every triangle. And using a very, very similar argument, you could also say that not only is c squared a squared plus b squared, then b squared would be a squared plus c squared. You would just kind of swap out and move things around. This would be, see the ab here, minus two ac. And notice the angle c here goes with side c here. So this would be the cosine of b. And the third rendition would be a squared is b squared plus c squared minus two bc cosine of this time angle A. And it turns out this is used to solve side, side, side triangles, which is one of those nice ones from math too. It's also used to solve side angle side triangles. Now I will make a side note. 
that side, side, side is kind of ambiguous in and of itself because I, if I gave you um, something like a two, a three, and a 10, or an 11, there's no way I can make a triangle with sides two, three, and 11 because one of the rules is any two sides together have to add up to more than the third side. So side, 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 is kind of ambiguous, but you'll, you would actually see if you tried the law of cosines, why that problem would not work. Anyway, now I don't personally memorize all three of these. I just know one of them and I just know the pattern that these angles go together and these are the other sides. So let's take a look at an example. I have two examples in this particular video that I wanted to look at. The first of which I'm going to go ahead and draw a figure this time. And I'm going to tell you that angle A is 67 degrees, that side AB is 7 units, and that side AC is 11. So we clearly have an SAS. And sometimes we give you a triangle and ask you to solve the missing pieces. I think everybody can picture that there's really only one way to put two sticks. 67 degrees apart with these two angles. There's literally only one way. So if I want to solve this problem, I need to find out what is the measure of angle B, what is the measure of angle C, and how long is side A. So here's what I've got to do. I'm going to go grab that. So notice the angle that I have. So I'm going to go with this version of the law of cosines because A is the angle that I have. So A squared is B squared plus C squared minus 2bc cosine a. Now let's just fill in what we know. Well, side a, I don't know. Side b, I do know. Side c, I know. And I do know the cosine of that. Well, if you kind of go through that mathematics, that's actually pretty straightforward. All of this is just a bunch of numbers. So let's just type that in. 11 squared plus 7 squared minus 2 times 7 times 11 times the cosine of 67. And I've got that a squared is 109.827. But I don't really want a squared. I want a. So I'm going to take the square root and I just found out that a, which is the one and only one, a is 10.4798. Actually, I'll go 9.9, nine, it doesn't matter. Probably didn't need that much precision. But you know, if you were to come over here and write that down where this goes, if you wanted to find the rest of this story, I'm just gonna write 10.48 there, I could now use the law of sines because I could say the sine of 67 is to 10.48 as the sine of let's say C down here is to seven. Now one, notice that I kind of stopped for a second because we've discussed before that the law of sines cannot give you an obtuse angle. Cannot do it because the inverse sine has to be in either the first or the fourth quadrant. So when I had to choose between finding angle C and finding angle B, I always go with the smaller of the two because once I have that, I wasn't necessarily going to do this whole problem, but I think maybe I should. I have the sine of C is 0.4. Uh, sine of C is uh, 0.614, 615, inverse sine, and now I've got 37.94 is the measure of angle C. Clearly, we only have one thing left to do, which is to find the measure of angle B, and that's just going to be found by taking the 180, subtracting what we had, and subtracting that original value, and I just found out that the measure of angle B is 75. 0 0.06. Perfect. So that was pretty straightforward. So in a side angle side, you'll have all of the information on this side, and you just have to take a square root, so you're going to do the law of cosines once and the law of sines once. Now, as it turns out, the side, side, side story is a little bit tougher for people. And obviously, it's going to be side, 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 uh, because somebody's going to say something like A is 8, B is, um, let's say, B is 12, and let's say I told you that C is 6. 
pretty clearly just side, side, side. But before we do anything, if I add any two of these sides together, does it, is it more than the third side? So I just look at the two little guys, eight and six are more than 12. So yes, this triangle can, and in fact will exist. So A, B, C, let's put our six here. Let's put our 12 here and let's put our eight here. Now, whereas the law of sines did not handle obtuse well, the inverse cosine was defined all the way from zero to pi or zero to 180. The law of cosines is brilliant for obtuse angles. So for me, although in the sines, I go for the small angle in the cosines, I always go big. So if there was going to be an obtuse angle, it would be angle B right here. So that's what I'm gonna go with. So I'm gonna go with the version that is B squared is A squared plus C squared. 2AC cosine angle B. So let's see what we know. I now know that B is 12, so this is 144. I know that A is eight. I know that C is six. Two times A times C, let's see, that would be two times A times C would be 96. Now, I often have students get to here and they make order of operations errors. We need to take this 144 and get rid of the 64, and we also need to get rid of that 36 first. So I'm down to 44 is negative 96 cosines of B. I almost was writing beta there for a second. Now I'm going to divide by this negative 96, and now I've got that the cosine of B is negative 0.458. Hey, by the way, if the cosine is negative, it cannot be in the first quadrant, it has to be in the second. So I know for a fact this is obtuse. So if I take the inverse cosine, I can find that the measure of angle B is 117.28 degrees. Now, I'm actually not going to finish this problem, but clearly we could now use the law of sines. I'm just gonna set one of them up. We could say the sine of 117.28 over 12 maybe would be equal to the sine of A over eight. And I don't need to worry about A being obtuse because we already had one. I already did the biggest one, so it's not possible to have another obtuse angle. So for solving side angle side and side 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 triangles, the law of cosines is pretty good. So I hope that was helpful. Um, try to do some of the problems on law of cosines using that, but I'm on, on the next video, I'm trying to keep them a little bit short. I'm gonna actually show you how we can use the law of cosines to also solve um, a side-side angle triangle. And so we'll be in with that one in just a few moments. I'm only gonna look at one of those stories and we'll talk about how that plays through. All right, have a good one, bye-bye.